Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special episode of the Human Echoes Podcast. I am Albert Berg, and joining me this week, for the first time in a really long time, is a great friend of the podcast and long time ago guest host, Hannah Elizabeth Thompson. Hi. Woo! <laughs> Confetti on the screen. I, I, I don't know if I can actually do that. Oh, I, I bet it. That wouldn't be, that shouldn't be too hard. I wasn't even engaged last time I was on here. I just had a boyfriend. And now and you're I'm married. married. Yeah. Halfway to divorce. <laughs> I know. I'm halfway there. Almost full circle. Ah. <sighs> And we are talking, we're bringing you, this is Viewer's Choice Month as we're recording this, by the way, but we are interrupting Viewer's Choice Month to bring you a very special episode about one of our favorite things ever. What could it be? What could we be interrupting something as important as Viewer's Choice Month for? It's this. Timmy Failure, we meet again. The greatest slash worst detective ever. He's... He's one of the worst, yes. I don't know, like, he's got a better attitude than Philip Marlowe, I'll say that. I would hire him. Well, I would hire him just to see what he would do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I just heard I can't he's seen... So, for those of you, back in the day when the podcast was audio only, uh, we had, we did the, we covered the first two books in this series. This is book three. Me and Hannah love Timmy Failure, and Timmy Failure is the kid detective that is a deconstructive deconstruction of all the other kid detectives uh, that you've ever heard of because he's awful at it and he's got a huge ego and there's these wonderful illustrations. I'm not going to open it up because anyway, I'll, I'll get lost. But <laughs> um, written by Stefan Pastis. Is that how you pronounce his name? Uh, I always Stephen forget. Pastis. Pastis. Oh, Pastis. Yeah. But I get the Stephis, Stefan right? Yeah, Stefan. Okay. Anyway, like Stefan the- Pastis. Uh, <laughs> Also the author of, or the drawer and writer of Pearls Before Swine, uh, which is a very popular comic it's on the awesome interwebs. Comic. And in, uh, he's also in Meat Space, right? Pearls Before Swine's in, like, newspapers and stuff, isn't it? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I, well, I don't want to say I grew up, I'm only 21, so to me it's, it's I grew up with Pearls Before Swine. But yeah, it's, I used to read in every newspaper that I could get my hands on because, like, he has painfully amazing puns. Like, during Sunday mornings, it'll be this enormous build-up to one very lame, like, should-have-been-obvious pun, and all of the characters in the comic actually break into the cartoonist's office in the comic and basically, like, threaten him. Because <laughs> he doesn't stop. It's awesome. Which is why I'm maybe not as big of a fan of Pearls Before Swine as you are. Per- Hannah Elizabeth, giant pun person, uh... But there's almost none in uh, Timmy Failure. I can't think of any that were, like, at all, really. He puts I, them I, in the titles, not really yeah, puns. And, um, and in, like, yeah, in the, in the chapter names, like, um, there's, like, a mention of, like, a he mentions a, a bird, so the title of the chapter is, like, Toucan or Not Toucan, that is the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there, there's, what was the other one? There's some really good ones, uh, and I'm going to find the lame one while I'm flipping through it. See, there's High Noon. That one's not good. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Look Backward Angel. Uh, Beauty of a Plan and the Beast. Anyway, he's just like... Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a wretch. Also, but, the titles of the chapters have nothing to do with what happens in the chapter. Like A little no. bit. Well, I mean, like, yeah, Toucan or not Toucan, that is the question. The only reason that it's titled that is at the very end of the chapter, like, he's, ba- he's his mom, he's basically asking his mom, like, is this apartment turning into a zoo now? And he briefly mentions, like, you know, what's next? You know, Toucan in the bathtub or something like that. And it's, so it's not exactly, like, revolving around it, but. It's about as good as the titles I come up with for the podcast. <laughs> the podcast titles are like, oh, there was one funny comment we made. The whole podcast is titled after that now. It works though. I, I, okay. I, I, I listen to episodes. Of the, well, yeah, I listen to episodes because of the titles a lot of the time. Also because of you guys. That's that's kind of an important part. But <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Come for the t- titles. Stay for the awesome hosts. Yes, exactly. Um, but this book in particular sees Timmy failure. Uh, in in the previous book he was taken to a different school, like a a charter type school, because he's so he's literally a like he's not just sort of cartoon bad. He's actually not a good student. 
Uh, and he gets put on, uh, he gets sent to another school for being such a bad student, like a charter school where all the like troublesome kid, trouble kids go. Finally gets back in this one, but he's on academic probation. And wouldn't you know it, like the biggest assignment of the school year involves him having to team team up with the the spawn of evil herself, <laughs> Karina Karina, uh, the other detective the in the class. I say Spawn of Evil. That's from his perspective. She's actually yeah. a really nice girl. Uh, and he learns a little bit about that in this book. Yeah, it's just the classic thing where, like, it's kind of obvious he has a crush on her, but when you're a little boy, you're not going to be, you know, like, just clinging to, like, a girl that you have a crush on. You have to be a little bit mean to her. So, you know. It's, he's it's, really it's, mean to her. Like, huh? I said, he's really mean to her. He is. He draw, yeah. Like, he, ta- he talks about, you know, he refers to her as possibly Satan and, like, draws super ugly pictures of her and, uh... Yeah, there's even one part where, like, he mentions, like, that she should go back to the fiery pit from whence she came and he has a doodle of, like, a bunch of, like, demons and flames, like, oh no, she's back! <laughs> <laughs> the doodles in this as, this are hilarious. But, so, it, it I think this one is interesting because it plays out more like a real detective story than I think... I remember the other ones doing like yeah. because th- there's this whole MacGuffin of the miracle report, uh, which is this fabled report that exists because they have to do a nature report uh, where they collect different samples of nature things and, uh, you know, talk about what they are. And the kids have heard about this miracle report that got an A plus 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 plus. They say five, five pluses. pluses. It it's five pluses. It's an A with five pluses. And they're like, if we can get our hands on that report, we'll be set for the nature documentary. So they they go about trying to get the miracle. They hire Timmy. Well, they're going to hire Timmy at first, and then Karina. Karina takes the case. But it actually does resolve where this thing actually turns up and ends up being a part of the plot. And I thought that was really interesting because I don't – the last one kind of had a mystery, but it was a little bit, like, silly because it was – you know, a mystery that they were setting up for the kids. Like, oh, everybody be a detective. And Timmy was like, yeah. no. Uh, and this one, like, it felt like, again, it's very Timmy failure, but it felt like it was a real sort of thing that was actually needing to be solved. And he didn't really solve it, but I don't know. Yeah. It, it almost fit that trope a little bit better. How did you feel about that? I loved it. I mean, it's, I, I was expecting it to actually be like a completely fictional report. So the fact that the Miracle Report by Lacey Miracle, was it Lacey Miracle? The girl's name is Miracle, but the fact that it was I think an it was actual Tracy, that, but yeah. Was it Tracy? Well, we'll shoot. Um, but I thought it was really wild that it actually ended up being a literal thing. Um, sorry, I completely like lost my train of thought because I was trying to think of other jazz to say. I'm going to be a mess today. It's, it's fair warning. <laughs> But the I, I I thought that that was cool, and then I I would have liked because he he ends up having to work with Karina Karina a little bit more. I would have liked a little more subtlety with him kind yeah. of having a crush on her. Now there are a couple things that happen in this book that I felt like could have waited until another book. Like you know I won't spoil it off the bat, but like you know the, the truth about Total, and then obviously his feelings for Karina Karina. How everything just kind of like escalated and jumped to what I think we could have saved for another book kind of like all happened in here and I I guess a lot does happen in these books it's like you know a major life event happens in every book we find out really like serious things about him but so it, which it is the like... charm by the way this is obviously yeah. a kid's book and we're talking about it in a serious manner we enjoy the kid aspect but also I think it the reason that it appeals to me is because it it walks that line where it has the fun for kids, but it really does have like an uh, sort of an underlying message of like, Hey, this kid's life actually does have problems. And you know, the other people around him are dealing with stuff and you're just seeing it through this really bizarre lens of you know, the super egotistical and, you know, not always truthful <laughs> kid, yeah, you know, first person. Definitely a lot of the things that, cause I mean, we're, this is like a case of an unreliable narrator. We're, we're just depending on everything that Timmy is telling us in these books, but we can still tell that he has kind of has a difficult life. He's being raised by a single mother. I don't think we've even heard anything about who his dad is. Um, I think it was in the second book we find out, like, you know, they move from a larger apartment to, like, a smaller apartment because his mom just can't afford to pay the bills there. Um, and then it's 
yeah, the fact that he is so he has these delusions of grandeur where he just thinks he's like the greatest is obviously like a type of coping mechanism for him because he's an outcast at school and nobody you know really I don't understand why his best friend is still his best friend he mistreats his best friend which there might be some like moments there that we, Timmy doesn't tell us about and there are some like things that that other people say that we hear about that Timmy is actually a really sensitive kid well and sometimes um, your best friend is your best friend too like sometimes part of having a best friend is just like yep that person's a dick sometimes yeah, I, I guess it's just the fact that like he like he frequently like talks down to Rolo though. Like you know he'll he'll tell him that like you know he's stupid or make comments about his weight or yeah, it's it's just to the point where like I'm not really seeing like what the benefit is for Rolo. But once again, I'm sure that there are some things like some interactions with him and Rolo that Timmy isn't telling us about because it wouldn't you know make us think that he's a, a big tough detective. Well, I think here here's a thought for Rolo. I think that Rolo actually kind of looks up to Timmy in a way. Maybe not looks up to him, but even though he's constantly dealing with Timmy's insanity and getting him into trouble, Rolo, because of his obsession with grades, right? Like, as Rolo's the nerdy kid, he's the one okay. who he has Stanford. He has Stanford spelled with a U. <laughs> Stanford. Um, but he's the one who's, like, all obsessed with what's going to happen with his academic career, and I think that probably a lot of that's pressure from his parents, and I think he maybe envies Timmy a little bit because Tim, Timmy can go off and not care about that stuff. <laughs> Rolo can't, and yeah. maybe he doesn't really want to, but he likes the idea of having somebody in his life who it doesn't have to deal with all that. Yeah. Who's just obsessed with, you know, with trivial kid stuff, basically. Yeah. Um, who can, like, run off and be dumb with a ton of confidence. Yeah, and, and I think Rolo maybe doesn't have that confidence, and that's maybe another thing that like he he is you know again we know nothing about Rolo's home life. Uh, you know he goes Timmy Feller goes over one I think in this book for a sleepover, yeah. or maybe in the previous book. Oh, um, it was this one, but it's just like we yeah we don't see anything of Rolo's house except his room. We don't I don't think we even see his mother or anything. It's literally it's just the only interaction we see like with Ro Rolo's home life is just Rolo in his room. But I remember getting the impression that he was pressured, like, he's not just getting good grades because he's, like, he's being pressured by his parents to do this. And so I think that there's a part of him that really envies, you know, Timmy's, you know, Timmy's freedom. And Timmy yeah. has great adults in his life, like, very, very, I mean, his mom is very supportive. In the previous book, it was his aunt who, yes. you know, oh, under man, his aunt. I love yeah. that woman. <laughs> <laughs> with her little, uh, her boom boom shoes. Oh my, yeah, and I mean like obviously Flo, which I'm in love with Flo, the biker. Finally like, came back in this one, by yeah, the way. I, and he came back at the perfect time too, when there's like a bully on the bus that's basically telling Timmy, "You find me the miracle report, or I'll beat you up." And like Timmy's finally like, just he's being submissive, like, "Okay, I don't have a choice," because he's fearing for his physical well-being. And the bus to this camp that they're going to stops in front of a diner and these bikers pull up in front of the diner and one of the bikers happened to be Flo the librarian who is best buddies with Timmy and he talks to Timmy and gives him a book and out of nowhere the bully's like okay I'll pay you whatever you want it's fine the it's the character of Flo the librarian I, it's it's definitely not I mean you know it's sort of a one note kind of joke but it is so much fun to have this like it's it, he's a librarian. He loves books. He's obviously very literary minded, and he's very supportive of Timmy. Yeah. And he's this like barbarian biker guy, <laughs> like in appearance. He's got tattoos. Yeah. He's got like the helmet that you know, and the the leathers that he wears. And he actually does ride a bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's like an actual like hardcore looking biker, and it's yeah. He, he's just like really sweet. He has a soft spot for Timmy. Well, he walks up to him, like, at the, went in the meeting that they have. Like, he just walks up to me. He's like, oh, hey, man, I'm reading this book called The Odyssey. It's about this guy who's trying to get home. And he, like, just gives him a copy of The Odyssey. Yeah. And he's like, thanks, I'll read it later. Which, Which was really, won't. <laughs> that was really, really kind of him. Because, like, he, when he gave Timmy the book, it was after Timmy had said that he didn't want to be going on the field trip, that he wanted to be home. So it's oh. it's just there are a lot of adults in his life that yeah they they are they do what they can to help him and he actually has like an awesome support system even if like he's going to credit all of his you know his good feels for himself even um I think it was in the previous book 
Mr. Jenkins, which I was shipping Timmy's mom and Mr. Jenkins so hard, but Devin Pass just spoiled it for me because he told me that they weren't going to be together. Um, <sighs> which, like, so there's the, the teacher in the second book, Mr. Jenkins, who actually found, I forget exactly what it was now, but he actually found a clever way to get Timmy to do schoolwork. Um, he made it sound like it was detective work. So that's, that's somebody else. And I don't understand why his mom doesn't end up like Mr. Jenkins end up like Mr. Jenkins, end up with him. Cause that, like he gets how to, how to teach Timmy and he seems to like understand him well enough and treat him like a kid. And I, it, it just, it would work out well. Also, he's the best looking male character in there. He's also the male character that looks the most like the author, which I'm going to mention that every time I talk to somebody about Mr. Jenkins, I don't think that that was a coincidence entirely. <laughs> Well, there's, like, I mean, if, if it was, he was the only guy who's being nice to Timmy, I could see that. But, I mean, it's not like it's one of those, well, oh, this is the only good character in the book, and it looks yeah, like the author. It's, it's the fact that he's the only male teacher who was able to get through to Timmy in the second book. Yeah, that's yeah, true. And, and, like, you know, take take Timmy's type of learning, like, you know, take his, his desire to be a detective and using that to actually help Timmy get a better grade than he would have normally. I don't know, maybe it's... It's wishful thinking. I, I just, I, I want Mr. Jenkins to play a bigger role, and I want them to end up together, but I don't think it's going to happen. Because when I mentioned it, the, the like, the two seconds Devin Pastors was following me, and I mentioned that to him, he sounded like it didn't even occur to him. Like, I just sent him a message, like, oh, I'm shipping Timmy's mom to Mr. Jenkins so hard, and he didn't even know what shipping was. He was like, shipping? You mean, like, you want them to be together? And it, yeah, it... That, that I think he was – he, he, you were on the internet and he was on the internet. I think he was assuming that you, like, were writing <laughs> fan fictions with, like, really detailed details oh. about things that adults do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe he was a little bit scared off by that. I... Yeah, well, I, yeah. I mean, like, there was a, some other things, like, leading up to that, that it should have been clear that I wasn't, like, going to be a creeper like that, but – Okay. I, I can definitely see that now, where it's just like, you know, oh, I'm planning something very special for the internet. <laughs> There's a Tumblr somewhere. <laughs> There's a Tumblr somewhere. I'm so oh, confused. man. I, do not look that up. I don't, I'm not looking it up. <laughs> like, I had no idea the enormous amount of fanfiction for literally everything out there. I wouldn't be 100% surprised if there was fanfiction about you and Tony out there somewhere. No, don't say that out loud, <laughs> Hannah. <laughs> Like, You're gonna okay. make it. As somebody's gonna be like, I bet there is there. There needs to be. I'm sensing some vibes there. Across I understand there. that that's how people's brains work, but don't yeah. don't yeah. encourage them, please. The nicest let's player that I know. He's like still a small time YouTuber. His name's Drew Beagley. Like literally nicest dude on YouTube. And even him, with as small as channel as he is, he has found fan fiction about himself and another left player there's two fan fictions out there and they actually did a video reading them so it's just like i started wondering wait how is it literally like anybody out there it doesn't matter if there's only a dozen people that know you on the internet there's a pretty decent chance that there's fan fiction that says things that you would never want to imagine in your entire life out there so yeah i now i'm kind of curious to look up fan fiction about you and tony i don't i don't know keep it to yourself <laughs> i don't want to hear I don't want to read. I don't. Is you this? Want me to that to you if I find it. Is this an ambush? Are you gonna start reading stuff out to me? Have you been writing this fan fiction, Hannah? Come clean. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been a year in the making. It features you and Mr. Jenkins. Ah. <laughs> uh, but even in this book, there was um talking about supportive people. The uh, the new character who I think w it was wasn't it implied that uh Timmy and uh Dorman Dave. Or not Timmy and Tor uh, but Dim Timmy's mom and Dorman Dave are going to end up together? Yeah, actually, in, yeah, in the end of the book, it ends with them, like, uh, what it ended up, oh, no, wait, he was at a baseball game. He went to a baseball game with Timmy, and it mentioned that Timmy's mom had actually previously dated Dorman Dave. And Dorman Dave, like, I, I didn't notice it the last time I read this, but he actually is really, really nice to Timmy, and he can actually, I can see him as a father figure. Yeah, um, definitely. That's what I was like, going to say. Yeah, like, at the beginning, when Timmy's on his mom's Roomba, and he rides out of the apartment building, and he's going towards the elevator, Dermot Davis, you know, he's the only little elevator for him, and he's like, hey, you have to do, like, you know, detective work. Like, he's acknowledging that he has, like, you know, his detective agency, and he's, you know, asking him about school. Um, and then he gave him a flashlight when Timmy was going to go, was it, yeah, it was Dermot Davis, wasn't it? When he was going to go to uh, to the camp 
Yeah, but he got it wrong. He said this is for your international spy work, and Timmy's like, yeah, I had to know. Yeah, I had to image, know amateur. Does it know what I do? <laughs> yeah, so it's, I can, and I can't believe, like, the last time I read this book, it totally went over my head. He wasn't even on my Timmy's mom radar, but I, I can see him as, like, a good father figure now. I'm just, I, I'm glad that this book is is like that. You know, I think a lot of kids' fiction tends to focus on the negative and focus on, like, the pet, the adults just don't understand me. Nobody yeah. understands. <laughs> yeah, and, and even, like, a lot of kids' shows, it's usually, like, the parents and the adults in the show are, like, the dumbest part of it. They just, they're not perceptive at all. And it's just more like the kid having to deal with his struggles in his own little, like, you know, with his peers and in this group and feel kind of alone, while all of the adults are just, they're the last ones to know and they're the idiots. Well, so, I did, like, I mean, you can kind of... The thing about that is, like, Timmy sees everybody as if they're unperceptive idiots, but they, yeah. like, so you get that sort of filter for him, but then you understand, oh, they actually do basically get him, even if they don't get him 100%, like, they're, they're yeah. pretty understanding. And at least, like, a lot of them are aware that he is a kid and he's going through some stuff, and, I mean, his mom is, like, at least very... She, pandering is the wrong word, but his his mom understands, you know, kind of why he is who he is, and she, she kind of, like, adapts her behavior to that. Like, she, the whole thing with Total, she will, you know, act like, you know, she's she's going to feed Total, or that, you know, Total has, he's wearing something, and, um, oh, what else was it that she just did, that she just did? Um, well, she was talking to Timmy on the phone about him, and oh. said she's, he was watching the sun sh- sunset. And she well, and she was also like aware that he he got homesick, and like you know, she referenced this thing about his the, his him being at his grandmother's house, and he's using the whole thing where like oh no, the pillows were too hard. I I wasn't homesick, so his mom just like starts rolling with okay, you get it. The, the pillows are too hard actually means I'm homesick. Which I love the way they they called that back when he goes to Rolo's house, and Rolo tells <laughs> him the story of the giant chum yeah. like chihuahua you know, or whatever. Like oh my gosh, the pillows are so hard. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> He'd be an exhausting kid to have, though. Dang, you wouldn't even know where he was. Like, you can't even have a freaking Roomba without him running off with it somewhere. It's better than the Buttermobile, though. Buttermobile? Why is why is that familiar? What happened? He at the very beginning he talks about like he had his like okay so in the first book his mom has a Segway, and that's right. his mode of transportation. And then he's getting around other ways. And in this book, he says he claims that he smears butter all over himself and has total pull him places <laughs> okay. and slides along the ground. Because why not? Wow. Yeah, he definitely has creative methods of getting around town. I that do. Enough. Were you. Okay, so you said you didn't want to spoil this, but I'm going to spoil it a little bit. There is. Yeah. If you guys really want to read this book, close your ears or whatever. Fast forward. But at the very end, there's an implication that Total is not real. Total is Timmy was... Failure's polar bear that he owns. Well, and I, I thought that it was pretty obvious at that point. Like, even, um, although it does leave the question, because didn't, didn't Total technically lead them out of the woods? So it leaves the question of, okay, who who actually led them out of the woods? But um, I, I think it kind of becomes obvious, especially near the end, when he decides to let go of Total and he, he returns the, the name of the detective agency back down to Failure Incorporated. Um, and then we find out about Karina Karina, how she has an imaginary friend who's an emperor penguin named Frederick, um, where, like, it, and she has her reasons for, for that as well. And I thought it was amusing that they said, well, they, they're from, like, they're from polar opposite ends of the world, and yet, you know, they're... I, I, the fact that it seemed like they were trying to make, like, a comparison between, like, you know, if Timmy's kind of the opposite of Karina, Karina, she only has her dad, he only has his mother, and yet they're together. Um, when, like, Karina, Karina even asked, like, do you think that Total and Frederick would get along? So I, it, it, it was it was interesting. I think it's pretty obvious, though, that, you know, Total is, and, and that made me really sad for, like, an entire day, finding out that Total is very likely imaginary. Um, I don't and, believe it. I do not buy into that it? nonsense. He's a I real don't, thing. I don't Dang want, it. I, I feel like it came out of nowhere, though, because there's no... I mean, I'm sure if I reread the second book more closely, I'd find something, but I, I feel like that there's nothing really 
in the other books that says that he's imaginary. And then out of nowhere in this book, they just mention, oh, I, I noticed you sit alone at lunch. And, you know, he thinks he's sitting with Total. Um, and then when he's on the phone with his mom and, you know, she uh, she acts like, you know, oh, well, he's he's looking at the sunset and he knows that she's lying, that Total isn't there because he never looks at the sunset. And then when she offers to take care of Molly Moskins's cat, uh, Senor Burrito, she says, oh, we don't have any other pets here. And then Tony's like, what are you talking about? We have a polar bear. And his mom just kind of like shoves it off. So it felt like it kind of came out of nowhere for me, which is another thing that I feel like I could have been like eased into with another book, just like going from total is such an important part to it being really obvious from the get go that, okay, apparently he's supposed to be imaginary now. Yeah. And maybe I was, again, like you, maybe I was missing stuff in the other books, but it felt like that. <sighs> There was so much detail given to him about his backstory and the fact that, you know, the foods that he liked and all the things. I understand that yeah. it's an imaginary friend and all that, but it didn't feel like that's the way they were going with it. And they liked yeah. the sort of whimsical elements in there of, oh, yeah, he has a has a polar bear. Yeah, and I, I feel like, you know, for this to happen in the third book, out of nowhere for us to – like, you know, he's, he's at least giving total a leave of absence – to just like do nothing but lay back and eat Rice Krispies treats. I feel like we could have just like enjoyed Total's presence a little bit longer. Um, or cool. had a book where he like total leaves, you know, yeah. like if you're going to go that way, then like let's and leave it so that Total can then, you know, you can actually have a letting go book. I don't, I don't buy that he's not going to be in the next book anyway. I like, think the fact that he said that he has a, it's a temporary leave of absence means that Total is going to come back, which means, because I, I think that the way we can view Total now is kind of like, it's an emotional crutch for Timmy. You know, he uses, like, Total as a way to, like, you know, he throws blame on Total. He It's it's a friend who's always there for him, and even if it's a really sloppy, terrible, messy, fat friend. Um, so I have a feeling that there's probably going to be something that happens in the next book that requires him to bring that crutch back. So Total's probably going to come back just because something else because it seems like there's at least like one major thing that happens just to me in every book obviously it has to um so something's probably going to happen like i don't know he and karina karina like a breakup or something like that and, and he requires his friend again how like how long do you think this series can go on i honestly with how much that happens in every book i i wouldn't be surprised if it ends with the next book or with book five <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I kind of feel like he, Seven Pastus is probably going to, like, give a warning at the end, like, you know, to be concluded instead of, like, to be continued or something like that. Um, but I, 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 I want to see this happening for, like, you know, 10, 15 books because I would love that so much. But at the rate that things are progressing with this, I can't really see this going on to be, like, a 10-book series. I think it might very well end by book five. Well, and it's obvious – I mean, obviously it's playing off the popularity of books like the Wimpy Kid uh, books, which I have and not read. That's what it's – yeah, I've never read those either because I, I never I never quite saw the hype for that. Um, but yeah, it, I think that's what it's most commonly compared to. People compare it to Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Actually, I think there's even like a quote on one of them. Oh, the, the author of Diary of a Wimpy Kid said Timmy Failure is a winner about the first book. So he's yeah. read it. So they're um, obviously drawing sort of a line there between those, but you – know. I, I don't know. I feel like I mean I'm with you. They don't ever give if I if I unless I'm wrong about this. I don't think that they ever give a specific like age for Timmy, but it's clear yeah. he's getting older to me. I mean especially with some of the stuff that happened towards the end of this book. I'm like all right. I was thinking of this guy as like nine, but maybe yeah. I mean I don't know. And I think just like based on his height and how like adults tend to treat him like you know he's a child that has to be like um not maintained but like you know restrained or something i was i was imagining like a really young kid but yeah the the trip to the the camp just kind of gave me like a different vibe for his age group also he looks like just like such a short little kid too so i i'm not sure i don't even think we're given a specific age group for him like we're not given like you know he's going into whatever grade but yeah but they do again. They touch on such they they have these sort of more serious themes to the point where I don't really want this. I don't want him to be a little kid forever, and I don't really want to see him in the same universe, not the same universe, but like the same series as a. Yeah, I I don't know. Like I don't know how you can 
you, it doesn't seem like you can continue this for super much longer, but it also yeah. doesn't seem like that he works as an older kid. Like, a teenage Timmy Failure is not... Yeah, no, like, it's... Now that guy's just being a jerk. I, I mean, he's say, being a jerk funny. now, but you can kind of write it off as funny. Well, and I mean, you can you can view his behavior towards a lot of people as simply a coping mechanism. The fact that, you know, once again, he's being raised by a single mother, it's not the best situation, he's an outcast at school. It's you can like empathize and like hurt a bit with him and like ride along with him with those feelings. If you're, you're thinking of just a little kid that life is happening to him and he's just responding to it. If I'm a mad, I could, I wouldn't read this if it was Timmy failure as a teenager, teenage Timmy would, yeah, he would just be a douche. He would be a jerk being mean to everyone who's offering an ounce of empathy towards him. And he would just be just, I, I don't know. He would be like a sociopath or something just zero respect for people's boundaries. And he would just, view himself as so superior when he should be mature and like taking care of his mother emotionally a bit more since you know if you're a bit older you should be able to take on that weight just the person who's giving you everything so i i would not read this if out of nowhere it's a teenage timmy or if this was like a teenage timmy series of books that has zero appeal to me i just don't like books with teenagers period but yeah. Well, I think it's actually a weird comparison, but there's another detective series that I really like called The Spellman Files, but they would had a similar character, uh, uh, what is the main character's name in that? I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, uh, Izzy, Isabella Spellman, um, and she starts out as very sort of, you know, kind of self-centered, you know, a little bit like self-absorbed, not to the level that Timmy Failure is, but, you know, she's obviously immature. She's an adult, uh, but oh. um, she she's just hasn't grown up the way she should. She's good at being a detective, but her family's kind of dysfunctional, and she's probably the most dysfunctional one in there. Uh, and it's very funny, but throughout the series, you see them give her more and more responsibility, and you kind of want, like, I don't want to spoil too much for people who haven't read the series, but the, the last book ends in such a way that basically they just say, yeah, we're not going to develop that character. You know, we oh, had a lot oh. of opportunities, and she could have, like, ended this and been like, actually, I'm now going to become an adult. But instead, yeah. she's like, yeah, I don't really feel like actually taking out more responsibility. And that bugged me a lot, and I don't want to see yeah. Timmy Failure do the same thing. I think Timmy Failure can end in such a way that he is growing up, and we see him, yeah. you know... No, I could see that, just because, like, I, I could actually, you know, besides how completely obnoxious and overconfident he could be, I mean, he obviously, like, really... He loves his mother and he tries to be supportive in his own weird way. Um, even when like he finds out that the lawyers, cause like his mother becomes a secretary in this book, legal secretary and the lawyers that she works with, she even mentions that they're rude to her. And, you know, he, you know, he kind of like lashes out in his own way where he's just like, well, you should, you should, uh, what was it? You, like, you know, basically take away a lot of their privileges. And he like, he draws a cartoon of like all of the lawyers and like, it looks like a, a pen from like a, a petting zoo or something. And his mom is like standing with her arms crossed. Like, yeah. Um, I, I think that there's actually like a bit of wisdom and like Timmy, I, I, I could definitely see him growing up. I can't imagine like if he is like a kid now, like, you know, 10 or 11, that he would just, his personality would be at a stasis. Um, so, I mean, I would at least hope that he would like, Stephen Pastors would like maybe jump ahead when he's a little bit older and we could see that development. But yeah, I, I can actually can't imagine Timmy like remaining the same as I think we've actually seen a little bit of growth so far in Timmy Failure. I could imagine like the end of whatever the last book is of like being a note from like adult Timmy. I don't know, <laughs> like like you know, written out like, man, I found these diaries, you know, and Aww. wow, I was kind of a jerk back then, but that you know, things worked sense. out or yeah, I, I don't know. That that actually makes me like really happy just thinking about that. I would be really really happy if the books ended up like that, where it's like Timmy like writing a note about his his younger self and like things that he might have learned in like a really sincere note. And that actually wouldn't entirely surprise me because you know as we've mentioned, as silly as these books are, they do deal with heavy stuff, and they do have these really sincere moments that have actually made me tear up these moments especially between timmy and his mother or Timmy, like you know realizing things about himself um such a great one in this in this book in particular when his mom says goodbye and tells him uh -oh. i love you when yeah. he goes to camp yeah, he says i didn't say i love you back because yeah, detectives can't deal with feelings 
And then, like, the end of the chapter is, but I hope she saw the note that I left on the fridge. And on the note, it just says, I love you too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's it's to be doing things in his own way in that way. I, I just, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and there are a lot of, like, surprising hitting in the feels moments where you're not quite sure, like, how to, like, okay, yeah, he, he's a little bit of a jerk, and then he turns around and he does something kind of sweet. And I think even in those instances, and we've talked about this in our previous reviews, but that, I think that there's a side of Timmy that he doesn't show when he's talking about himself. I think mm-hmm. he actually is kinder and more emotional and, you know, more caring than he lets us know. Yeah. You know, because I think that he feels like that he's presenting what he thinks is the best version of himself. So he needs to be this sort of tough, hard-boiled yeah. kind of, and... like, gritty guy. <laughs> and that's actually, that's a really, really cool thing about like i i would not have expected that i would enjoy a book like this where once again a case of an unreliable narrator where you can't 100 percent trust what he's saying because all you're reading is it's like a stage we're just seeing what timmy's putting out there for us to see but the fact that it is leaving so much for us and i think oh man especially since it's a kid and it's a kid who's like who's trying to act like an adult and is trying to seem so like brave and invincible and and brilliant it makes it so much more hitting in the feels when you're reading this stuff and thinking, okay, you know, there's, there's obviously some things that he's not telling us. There might've been moments where like, you know, maybe somebody like made him cry or he felt really bad about himself. And it, the fact that it leaves so much to the imagination makes this book series actually a little bit more inspiring to me. I'm a little bit, I'm I'm not sure if they're going through with this, but I'd heard a while back that they were thinking about doing a Timmy failure movie. And I like, the more I think about it, the more I just I don't want that. No, that I, gosh didn't didn't they try to make uh, they made Diary of a Wimpy Kid into a movie and that ended up flopping enormously, didn't it? They made two of them, so it couldn't have flopped <laughs> that enormously. Somebody must have watched it on DVD at least. Well, Avatar flopped enormously, and for some reason they're making a second one of those. They're but making they're... another Avatar movie, like The yeah, Last Airbender. Like, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say the av- like James Cameron's Avatar did not oh, flop. No, 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 oh no, not not. <laughs> the like, opposite of that is true. Avatar. Yeah, I mean, I mean, The Last Airbender, and that's just because was it? I forget who who actually directed The Last Airbender. M Night Shyamalan. Oh wow, yeah, and he was basically like, I feel like there's more of the story to tell, so we're gonna pump out another film, and everyone's like, no, <laughs> we don't want it. We're I'm not sure that that's true. Really? I've only heard really horrible things. No, no, I mean, I'm not sure that he's making another one. Oh, he is. Are you sure? Because his newest film is The Visit, and he's got another one with Bloomhouse coming out that they're going to be like little $5 million cheapo handheld found footage films that he's making now. Let's see. And actually, I'm looking at it right now. I'm not saying... He, he may have said he wanted to make another one, but... uh. I, I don't know that anybody's actually dumb enough to give him more money well, to make another one. I saw I saw a discussion about it on like Reddit or Imgur, and people were angry. Okay, let me see. Now I'm curious. Imgur two. Are you sure you're not thinking of the sequel to James Cameron's Avatar? No, no, no. It it was because they because... are making like three of those. No, because the whole thing was, and there was even, like, you know, reaction gifts of, like, The Last Airbender were like, you know, we didn't, we don't want this, we don't want another one. Um, the Last Airbender 2. Okay, let's see. Ooh, Avatar Wiki, fancy. Okay. Based on book two. At one point, oh. the possible sequel for the live-action film. Uh, status... They have yet to denounce decisions for the last Airbender sequels or the possibility of a reboot, even though the film has grossed three hundred and nineteen million dollars worldwide. So I think I, th- I think it's very unlikely. Okay. Alright, so happen. it might have been the internet jumping the gun then and just blasting out about I was gonna say I'm pretty immersed in movie news. Uh <laughs> and if there was a serious discussion of M. Night Shyamalan making another Airbender movie. I feel like I would have heard about it. Okay. Yeah, Lester Number so. 2 was, at one point, the possible sequel. Okay. Never mind, then. Cool. Glad we got that cleared up. Speaking of sequels, by the way, 
We don't know if it'll be the last one, but for sure it's the next one. Timmy Failure number four, Timmy Failure Sanitized for Your Protection, yes. is coming October 6th. Uh, which is why we're doing this now, because we realized we had to get this one reviewed before the new one came out. So, uh, I'm super excited for that. I, I yeah. own all of them. I can't wait for AJ to be interested in reading them with me. <laughs> or reading them yeah. on his own, that's fine too. No, these are so good, and I, I kind of wish that I had been, like, a bit younger when, like, this jazz came out, because it's one of those things, like, um, like the Sisters Grimm, which is, it's this series that's supposed to be, like, you know, the great, 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 great granddaughters of the Brothers Grimm. I started reading that when I was 11, and I, I loved, like, seeing, like, the different perspectives that I had when I reread it a couple years ago, so I kind of wish I had been able to see this, and, like, you know, you enjoy the silly bits as a kid, and then I feel like it's, like, when you would watch a kid's cartoon when you're a bit older, and you suddenly, like, realize, like, wait, there's some stuff going on in there that I missed. So I would imagine... Sisters like, Grimm, huh? That sounds interesting. Oh my gosh, I love that book series. The worst book in the series was the very last one, and I have a feeling because the author had to be on a deadline, and it was super rushed, and it was... Like, the villain in, in the Sisters Grimm, he has people kidnapped, he has people murdered, he destroys an entire town, he ruins lives, he destroys livelihoods. It, he even... The, the sisters in it, their parents are kidnapped. He's the one who kidnapped their parents. He ends up having their best friends murdered. And their mother is pregnant. He ends up kidnapping the pregnant mother. She gives birth while she's still like in this coma that he puts her in. And then he possesses their newborn baby brother. So they go through all of this. And I, I won't say exactly what happens at the end. But they freaking... It, it ended with like a drop in the water after everything that the villain had done. So it was terribly unsatisfying and I, i'm actually planning on like writing my own version of the last book because it was really <laughs> depressing like oh it was so bad it was it was like um dean coons dean coons has done that a couple times in his books where he takes you through like even the eyes of like a serial killer or someone who kidnaps and tortures folks and you're waiting like okay this is building up to like some like epic this guy's gonna get what's coming to him and you want like this delicious like thing where you know the the villain just gets what's coming to him and I believe it was, like, two of his books that I've, I've read of his. Others have been, like, equally as short. But the bad guy just gets shot. The end. And that's it. There's no, like, epic fight scene where, like, you know, he, he you know, talks about, like, how much, you know, he hates the people that he's been doing this to or whatever. It's just literally, like, you know, people chase each other for 300 pages or so. And then we eventually, at some point along the way, come across, like, you know, the, the fight between our hero and our villain. And then it's just over in half a paragraph. Oh, I, that's... That's why I don't read Dean Koontz anymore, except for Odd Thomas. Because Dean Koontz is frustrating. I want to point out, by the way, The Fairy Tale Detectives, The Sisters Grimm, Book 1, is available for Kindle for like $2. Yeah. If you're one of yeah, them Kindle people. Yeah, the, those books came out, I think they came out when I was like 11, so it was like 10 years ago. I wish the Animorphs books were that cheap. I've never read an Animorphs book. Are they not cheap? Uh, hold on. I'm going to pull it up here. Since we're doing research and we have time and it's our podcast. Those are the ones with the really freaky covers, right? Where it's like, it's just a person, like, gradually morphing into, like, an animal? Or yeah, those it? were, they were revolutionary at the time. Uh, yeah, the Kindle version is, like, six bucks for one book. And they're not super long. Oh. I mean, there's 30 books in the series. I would love it if there was, like, a hundred dollar wow. deal where you could get all of the, like, all yeah. the books in the Animorph series digitally. Yeah, wow. But you yeah, can't. Well, I'll have to look at, and I guess that that might be the magic of libraries. I imagine there's there's libraries out there that have those books. Well, that's how I read them back in the day. Yeah. I didn't. I think I bought a few. I remember buying, oh the, uh, what is the one with the, uh, the Elemist. The Elemist Chronicles was awesome at at the time. I have no idea how it holds up for an adult. <laughs> but when I was like. 15 or 16 i was like oh my gosh this guy like started out just as a random guy and basically turned into a whole god <laughs> wow and like anyway it was a little bit like unlikely how we they kind of got there but seeing the whole journey of that character anyway yeah. the elemis was a really interesting myth mythological i say mythological but like you know how different series have myth arcs well the elemis right. was like this thing that showed up that had literally the powers of a god they're like well why don't you help us defeat the yurks and he's like you don't you don't get it like that's not how it works right. i don't just snap my fingers and do stuff i could but <laughs> like 
there's a bigger thing going on that you don't understand and just deal with it. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, 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 I don't know. That sounds epic. Speaking of things that sound epic, did you watch any more Z Nation, Hannah? No, no, I just watched like some clips and some trailers, but I haven't had time to actually watch it, but it looks like a lot of fun. That is such an odd show. People either love that show or hate that show. Um, Is it just because it has like some like low budgety vibes or? I think that's what it is. I mean, not everything's for everybody. I don't particularly like like The Walking Dead, you know, and a lot of people like The Walking Dead. So, yeah, the Walking Dead, the Walking Dead just reminds me of like a lot of series that started out being something like that could have been really meaningful and awesome. And then just they lingered on, you know, unimportant details or just like the Walking Dead. And this is a really weird comparison, but it reminds me of, of a short lived series. It was only four seasons. I guess that's not exactly short, but it was a series called Prison Break. And also Human Target, like all of these shows had like really epic like premises and the characters were like really interesting at first and you you know you're on the edge of your seat, you want to see what happens. And then nothing really happens with the main character. They just kind of stay the same. So what is you know what what do us viewers have to do except get kind of attached to a side character that we only see every other episode? And Yeah, I, I actually had experience where I, sorry, go ahead. No, that that was actually about it. You're fine. Well, I was gonna say I tried to get back into the Walking Dead and, like, I had rage quit season one at the end. <laughs> I, I hated the end of season one. Hated it, hated it, hated it. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I waited, like, six or seven months. I was like, all right, I, you know, I liked season one quite a bit until the very end, but I'll give it another shot. Maybe season two picks back up. Watch the first episode of season two. Rage quit again. I was like, these people are stupid. Yeah. Okay, so I get to the beginning of season three. Is Rick still mad at... Linda because she slept with his best friend? Is that oh. still why they're pissed at each other? Okay. No, that confused me too. I was really confused. Because, so when he first finds out about it, obviously he's hurt, but I thought he went through the whole thing in season two where he actually came to forgive her. He was like, I understand. You know, you were afraid. I was under the impression that he forgave her completely, and that was water under the bridge. And then out of nowhere, he's angry at her again. Which... Like later on, it'll be. I, I think it becomes kind of obvious why they start doing that again, and it's it's a it's a really it's a cheap reason why they make him pissed off at her again. Um, but no, that that made no sense. There are actually like a lot of a surprising amount of character interactions in that show that don't make sense. So, but especially especially Rick and was it just his fiance at the time, or was she actually his wife when that whole I thing? I thought went down? she was his wife. They have a son together. I mean, you know, granted, you don't actually have to be married for that to happen, but he seems like they seem like they're married. Yeah, uh, they definitely act like a married couple. Um, yeah, but I <laughs> they hate each no, other enough. But, <laughs> um, but no, that that seriously did come out of nowhere, and I'm not sure if it was just like lazy writing or not. But yeah, I I, I was actually. And I mean, I, I binged watched like the last half of season two into like half of season three. And I was completely, I was thrown for a loop because I, he basically said that he understood why she did it, that she was alone and she was afraid and like he was there for her. And like what kind of person wouldn't have done that? She thought he was dead. The apocalypse yeah. happened. You know, yeah. it's not like she was she unfaithful was... to him. I mean, yeah. technically she was, but he, she didn't know. Because she thought that, yeah, he, she thought that he was gone and Shane was there to protect her and her son. And he was, they were experiencing things together. Like, you know, they were both there when everything started going down really quickly. So, it, yeah, it, I mean, it'll, if you stick through it, it's a cheap reason they made him mad at her again, but it's. But there, there's a, there's kind of a reason for it, and it, I actually I ranted the. Oh, so there like there's something in between the seasons that, like, shows up that there's a good reason for it somehow. Well, there's there's just they. Because again, they I skipped season. season two. Like I was just like I'm gonna jump ahead. Oh, you skipped but... season two. Okay. Yeah. No, they just something happens in season three where it's it's a cheap reason they're making her mad at her again. They're making her they're making him mad at her again. It's it's to. It's to make you hate and hurt later on. And when I saw it, it made me angry because it was it was just really cheap writing. Okay. Um, but no, I'll, I don't like any of the women in that show until you come across a chick that wields swords. And I'm pretty sure her name's Michonne. It's either Michonne or Michonne, but she's amazing. And she's my – because she's the only 
woman in that show who has like legit survival instincts who can like fight and stuff. And it was, it was awesome when I saw it. Cause I've, I've quit the show so many times, but it's the fact that I see it posted and talked about everywhere and everyone's in love with it. So it's like, okay, there's a reason some everyone's watching it. And I, I'm not sure if it's just more like, okay, people are DVRing it and it's, there's nothing else to watch after you get home from work. But, um, well, the one thing I like, you mentioned strong female characters. The one thing I like about, really like about Z Nation over Walking Dead is it's a, it's a fairly long amount of time since the apocalypse. It's like three years since the oh. first outbreak when you okay. start out in Z Nation. So everybody in the show <laughs> is experienced with zombies and don't right. treat them like it, they're a big deal. Right. I mean, that yeah, like, if there's a like... bunch of them coming, they're like, all right, well, we got to get out of here <laughs> or whatever. But, like, going from that to The Walking Dead and they'll see, like, they're, like, running around. Like, for one thing, they go into that prison yard that's full of zombies and start piking the zombies. I'm like, the zombies will come to the fence and you can, like, <sighs> it just, well, it just I... bugged me so much. Like, just pike them in the head when they get to the fence and, <sighs> And I will say, like, they're, now their setup at the prison does get pretty clever, and I'm not sure if there's like a there's like a break in the middle of season three. There must be, um, but there does actually come a point where like the front gates they come up with this system that's basically just making the zombies walking into stuff and killing themselves. So they they do get a bit more clever. It definitely takes them a minute, and they they do end up just like I feel like I'm gonna be a hero right now, and it's people doing really stupid things and unnecessarily sacrificing themselves. There's a lot of, I think, unnecessary death in The Walking Dead, which and I, I guess that might be just because it's really easy to replace characters. If you kill somebody off, it could just be like, oh, look, it's another survivor. How convenient. Come to our group. And then they can kill someone off. So, oh, look, there's another survivor. Come, please come to our group. Um, so, yeah, they – also, there's there's one character is – um. now if I say the name, it's going to spoil it. But there's one character I waited so long for them – to just to get rid of them because I hated them so much and they're the stupidest. There's no reason they should have survived as long as they did, and it takes way too long for them to die. So yeah, it it yeah it just. I do I like I, again like they weed that stuff out in Z Nation really fast. There's nobody who's acting stupid, and the women <laughs> are really fun and strong, and all the characters are interesting. Like right. they're very. Again, it's more fun, so they're, you know, they're cracking jokes about the zombies, and, like, <laughs> and the zombies aren't, like, I mean, the, the the zombies are part of the fun of the show, but, like, they aren't there as, like, this is a big threat, the zombies are. Yeah. It's, it's more about, like, the people dealing with their, you know, and, and they don't have, again, they have issues that they deal with, but they're not big and whiny things, and they all, I don't know, like, The Walking Dead just seems more the people in that just seem so much more whiny to me. Like everybody in oh, Z Nation is just like, all right, well, this is the apocalypse. <laughs> everyone is a wuss in The Walking Dead. Everyone except Daryl, which Daryl is, I, Daryl and Michonne are the only reasons I would ever watch that show still. But no, The Walking Dead is accidentally funny sometimes. And I was trying to remember some of the lines, but there are some moments where like, it'll supposed, it, it'll supposed, English. It's supposed to be like this intense moment or something, and someone will say something like when they see a zombie, like something along the lines of, you know, looks like we have some friends on their way over here. And it's supposed to be like dark and serious, and you're supposed to be afraid. But I just ended up laughing because it's just kind of, it the the amount of drama, unnecessary drama, is just it's very abundant in The Walking Dead. Well, th there's a really great thing in Z Nation where the episodes almost each episode ha takes place in a different location and a lot of times it'll t it'll they'll each have like they're not completely self-contained but mm -hmm. each episode sort of has its own story arc rather than sort of being a whole season long thing there's stuff that carries over through the whole season but you can watch a single episode and have a whole story so they'll have things like cults that worship the zombies in one episode and then another episode there's like this it was a really fascinating episode. A cult of all women, uh, who had decided they were like they had been started by this the ex or you know I say ex wives but like the the wives of this Mormon guy who uh, had ended up dying, and they decided that the men were responsible for all of the awful stuff that happened in the world, and so <laughs> they have this wonderful idyllic compound where the zombies can't get in, but they are. Like, they don't let any of the, the men, like, they, they don't let men in either. 
And when they have children that are boys, when they grow up to be 12 years old, they just send them out and say, all right, your dad's in Salt, Salt Lake City, start walking. And it's like 200 miles to Salt Lake City, and if they do get there, it's overrun by zombies. Um, wow, that's... But that's there's a character really that, like, who's a main character in the show, and you've, you've followed her all through, and she, like, gets sucked into their cult. Like she, like she realizes that she wants to be a part of that, and it's such a fascinating build up. For one thing, you get to you know the other stuff that happens before that that kind of primes her for that. But yeah. uh, to have you know, and that's a whole like that whole episode is just this really great, perfect sort of representation of what it's like to. And the great thing too is, while they could have gone cheesy and made these guys like gals, I guess the the girls in this cult be very, very obviously the bad guys. But they don't. They never do anything that's, like, really explicitly amoral. I mean, they kill people, but, like, the people they kill are actually really bad people. And when the, the team does show up, they're like, they don't shoot it. I mean, they shoot at them to warn them. But, like, they, you know, the, all all they're concerned about is just staying separate and not letting any men in. And if, as long as they can do that and they can rescue more women from the bad guys that are out there, then they'll do that. And so it's this fascinating, like, you want to not like them, but the way they're presented is not this, like, uber evil, like, these are the bad guys. It's just sort of like, these guys aren't <laughs> quite right. And... and I wish... Oh, sorry. No, just that that was basically it. Just that, like, oh. you, can, you can say that they're not... There's reasons not to like them, but they're not, like, insanely evil. Yeah, and I, I think that... That's kind of something that's missing when it comes to most zombie themed things. And when it comes to like the, you know, of course it always ends up like humans do end up dividing themselves, but there's not really a lot of psychology that you can empathize with when it comes to zombie type stuff. It's just always like, you know, us against them type crap. Um, and I, what people don't realize is that it, in a situation where it would be like, you know, a zombie takeover of the world, there would be a lot of just like your instincts kicking in. There would be fight or flight. There would be the fact that, it's human nature to want to be part of a unit and we, we automatically trust people that are similar to ourselves. So it would make sense that women would kind of make their own group because we, they would want to be part of a unit of people who could understand them, understand like, you know, their needs on a, you know, on a cycled basis. Um, well, even what they're going through. I was going to say the, the, there's earlier in the show, there's a great moment where like one of the girls gets taken, one of the girls in the groups gets taken and, uh, the two there's like three women in the group three main women uh and you know they they was a trade thing where like they traded one girl for another uh with some people who had already known the the girl that got traded and the the group got the girl that they knew back and she gets out and she says to the other girl in the group she's like we got to go back for her and they're like we're not going back for her because they kind of just met her she's like no we got to go back with her you don't know what it's like and the the one sort of douchebag guy who's the like who's the half zombie in the group he's like oh it's a girl thing and they both look at him and they're like yeah it is <laughs> it's a girl yeah. thing like deal with it like it's it's hard for women in the apocalypse and they don't <laughs> like skirt around that or try to make it it's something it was it was I don't know, their gro- moment was great yeah yeah and that that's one thing like that sounds really refreshing and i definitely want to see like even just um when I saw the trailer and I recognized actors that I saw, like out of New Orleans, like I'm all hyped up, like, oh, I want to see, like, you know, what, what they did in that. Um, it's always, it, it, I have a feeling it'd be really refreshing to see, like, some accurate psychology of what would happen if you're actually in that situation when people's, like, the instincts that you can't really dance around anymore have to come out and you have to address them. So that sounds really interesting. Well, I, I hope that you get into it and you like it. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, people are, you know, have different opinions, and I respect people's, you know, right not to like Z Nation if they don't. But having just rewatched it a second time with my wife, uh, and knowing everything that happens, I was still, I was still in awe. I was when I, especially when I got to the end, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so well put together and perfect. And a lot of people have said that the first three episodes, or the first, yeah, first three episodes are a little bit. You know, th- that may not be the strongest part of the series. Uh, and, and that, I, I've never really I mean, liked that argument, but it does take a little while for you to kind of latch on with the characters and be like, okay, I'm I'm really on board now. But it yeah. does, like, through the whole season, it gets so strong and so good towards the end. <sighs> I mean, that is, that is the case for, like, most series, where the first five episodes, I don't think, should really count as, like, you know, 
this is what the series is just because it's it's the show still figuring itself out the writers aren't even 100 percent sure the actors aren't 100 percent sure about the people that they're playing so it, when you're like first being introduced to it it's kind of like the first three chapters of a book i usually have to like muscle my way through the first three chapters of any book before i'm really sucked into it because you know you're you're figuring out what you're even looking at so it's but yeah i'll, I'll definitely watch it that sounds that sounds really neat the the whole uh, speaking of opinions like i was looking up reviews of that and it was fascinating to me somebody was listing like hey these are all pretty good except for like the one episode die zombie die again that's terrible you know like you can just forget watching that episode and i was like that's my second favorite episode of the series i mean granted there's only 13 but like it's the one with citizen z and the russian cosmonaut and then die zombie die again like those are my two favorite episodes and then the finale is pretty good too but uh, i forget what the one was anyway so i just hope that people I, i'm recommending it i hope people like it if you don't don't hate me i'm weird i know i like odd things but now, the uh, only thing that that might be difficult for me is for some reason like my my instinctive opinion of something is kind of like snobbish where if it looks like it isn't like the highest production value or it looks like low budget then it takes me a minute to like shut my brain off to that and like focus on what's happening. So it might take me a minute to like sink into that since like it, it is sci-fi, yes. Yes, and it's produced by the Asylum. Oh, okay. So yeah, like so go in expecting the low budget. Like it is does, yeah. not, does not look good. The zombies are okay. I mean the zombies, you know, you just put some paint on some people and they look cool. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. uh, the digital effects are just very slapdash but it just sort of you know it's, it gives you the premise of the story as, as long as you can sort of not obsess about that too much yeah. uh the stories yeah, and the characters are a lot of fun yeah definitely i'll uh it's probably just going to take me like an episode or two to like completely shut my brain off to that but i'll definitely once i'm actually involved in like what's happening and get attached to characters and stuff i won't have an issue with it it's i'm all excited first, it's just like, season two is coming out i i it may be out already by the time this airs on September 11th is the first episode of season two. And I, I can't find anybody to do like a recap podcast with me. So I'm just going to do it by myself and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think it's time to wrap this up. Uh, we've been going for an hour, Hannah. We got Yay. a full podcast out of this point five. <laughs> Talked about Timmy failure and Z nation. <laughs> Obviously the connection. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just I, I I saw like a really obvious uh, connection there. I think I think Timmy failure would be interesting in a zombie world. Uh, that would be fast. That somebody write that fan fiction. <laughs> Timmy failure and then like Mr. Jenkins Jenkins and Timmy's mom together fighting zombies. Yeah, and, and then there's a there's the bowling turkey out there as one of the zombies trying to get at them. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, you can find more of our stuff at humanechoes.com. You can also support the show there. You guys are great. I don't know what's going to be happening next because I'm not exactly sure when this is going to come out. But I believe we're still in Viewer's Choice Month. And that is going to be a fun ride. So stay tuned. And we'll be back next week with something else. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>